Well, thanks for having me tonight. Um, as the introducer said, um, I started at Santa Fe College University back in uh, 1989 when I was in a doctoral program in philosophy at the State University of New York, and uh, I planned to write my dissertation on the relationship between the loss of cultural diversity and biological diversity. And um, we tend to know a lot about uh, extinction rates and the loss of species on the planet. You know, we routinely speak quite correctly um, of the mass extinction crisis. But an even bigger crisis on the planet today is the loss of cultural diversity, which you can really see in terms of the extinction of languages. You know, Taken in a percentage term, far more languages have gone extinct on the planet uh, than species have as a percent of languages due to globalization of Western culture. Um, today, anthropologists classify about 90% of all existing languages on the planet as endangered and expect them to disappear in the next 100 years. And I believe you know, if humans are around in 10,000 years, even if they're around in a couple thousand years, and they look back at this period of history, the last five, 600 years or so, um, the most overwhelming fact that they'll see is this period of time when the globalization of European culture resulted in this never seen before um, complete homogenization of diversity on this planet in terms of cultural and biological diversity. And that's really the big story of our time, the big story of the last 500 years. Um, I never did finish the dissertation. Um, ended up starting uh, a Center for Biological Diversity. Uh, eventually was kicked out of my doctoral program summarily. Um, we're not completing it. Um, and that's been, uh, that's been a pretty fun ride for the last 27 years. Um, most recently, uh, getting to meet these guys um, was real interesting. Um, right now, there are 36 people associated with the Malheur standoff or the 2004 Bundy, Nevada standoff in federal custody. Uh, and these are a bunch of them. Um, I think that by the time uh, all the cases come, there's probably going to be an order of uh, 50 to 70 of them uh, that are going to go to trial. Um, I got to, uh, I got to, uh, I, I went up to Burns uh, and the out here with a uh, group of folks up there, amazing group of activists, um, to protest. Uh, what was happening and to tell the Bundys that the Malheur was not occupied, that this was still public land. And this is a photo from one of the, one of the rallies we did. Um, because our group is not quite as dangerous looking as their group. And uh, uh, we're not armed. There is a guy in a strange red hunting hat, but um, our group was unarmed. Um, also got to meet up there uh, members of the Burns party. Um, who came up and rallied as well and spoke out against the um, occupation. And I'm not going to talk a lot about um, my time up there, but I want to talk about uh, uh, one of the things I did was to try to generate as much media attention as possible when I was up there. But there was one story I could never get the media to write about, no matter how much I pushed, and that was asking the question. Why is it that every single year of Bundy occupation at some time or other has blurted out an outrageously racist statement? Hmm. This is just a coincidence. How is it that the movements that they expressly follow, the sovereign citizen movement, the posse comitatus movement we started here, important. Um, the Christian white identity movement, all were racist in their ideology. 
and what is the background to this? And I just did not get the media to bite on that, because um, that, I think, is in many ways the, the greatest taboo to touch up there, and they weren't willing to go there. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So I want to look at a few of these uh, folks up here a little more closely. Start off with this guy. Who knows who that is? Yeah. So that's Clive Bundy. Um, he's managed to get, as of yesterday, five of his 14 kids put in federal jail. Uh, we'll see how many more are arrested, and he himself is. Um, so, you know, Clive was getting a lot of attention in the media, in the right wing, in a mainstream way, um, until this moment. And this was the beginning of the end of sort of interest in Clive Bundy. And there was a lot of outrage about this. Uh, but what really struck me about it was the outrage also seemed to say, well, crazy old white guy. We all know some crazy old white guy. He's racist, right? Um, and so it was not addressed. Um, as whether this was a systematic issue or not. Um, and it is a systematic issue. If you, if you look at that pocket constitution he's holding there in his hand, uh, you'll see that come up later. Um, so let's look at oops, another one. There is Ryan Bundy, uh, Clive's son. Uh, here's Ryan at the mouth here. Um, First, he starts off with a seemingly strange notion of history that there were cattle in America prior <laughs> to white. Um, and then he moves on to tell us that um, the Indians did have a claim to the land, but somehow they mysteriously lost it. It's kind of like if you lost your keys as you're going out of the house or something, like they just misplaced them. Um, and then tells us that there are things left in the past, but the current culture is the most important. Um, this, but all these things up here, as sort of crazy as they seem, are really not crazy at all. I mean, these are very systematic belief systems. Um, the Bundys believe that there's no public land. Federal government's not able to own any land. And that land belongs to the people who were there first under their notion of natural law. And the people that were there first, according to Bundy's, were the ranchers. <laughs> uh, consequently, they have the right to land. Now, this presents some logical problems. Um, the very existence of Native Americans is a threat to this whole ideology uh, of whoever is first <laughs> takes the spoils. Um, and so one of the things you see throughout the uh, uh, long history, much longer than most people know, of uh, the bunnies that have on public land uh, always end up attacking Native American tribes, always end up attacking Native American cultural sites. Um, because they have this intense need to deny any authority, any presence of the tribes. In fact, you'll notice, going back to this odd historical notion of uh, keeping cattle, cattle being on the land before the white people here, this is actually a notion that appeared over and over again um, in uh, the sort of right wing culture, uh, where they want to assert somehow ranchers were actually here first, even with the cow. Um, I was living in Catherine County uh, down in New Mexico. It's a very right-wing, sagebrush county. It makes uh, Harney County look like Eugene. And, um, and they have this whole theory down there that these Irish ranchers actually came to America before Native Americans were here. Um, <laughs> and therefore, they have a right to this land. And as crazy as it sounds, you got to realize sort of the depth of the racism that's involved in these kinds of theories to be able to believe in the depth of the need. Um, also, oddly, given that the uh, 
Bundys are so insistent uh, on preserving their notion, their overall notion of ranching, that they want to tell us that it's, it's the current culture that is most important, um, even as they're trying to revive a sort of 1880s notion uh, of America. So moving on, we've got Ryan Payne. Uh, he was uh, in charge of sort of military logistics for the whole group, military guy. Let's look at Ryan here. Um, he got radicalized uh, when hooking up with the Bundys and came to realize that slavery did not exist in America, he says. Uh, and people were better off as what we call, quote, slaves. Um, and then went on to complain about Jews trying to control the world. This reference here um, to the not being slavery is something you see over and over again. So remember back at uh, Clive's, uh, let me tell you about the Negro moment. Um, and that's why it's important to see these are not just crazy rantings of individuals. These are systematic um, thoughts. These are actually philosophical positions that have been worked out over decades in some detail. In fact, if uh, skip back here, and a lot of it are in this constitution right here. Um, when um, Bundy and their militia were up here and, and in previous episodes, they were all running around with this popular constitution and proudly holding it up and telling us that all their work was about upholding the constitution. Now, there are hundreds of different publications of pocket constitutions you can have. They always pick this one. I thought, oh, that's kind of funny. Uh, how many all end up with that one? So I started researching it. That is a version of the Constitution put together by a man named W. Cleon Skousen. He's an ultra right wing, uh, anti Semite, racist Mormon uh, who was a public figure in the 1950s and 60s. Um, and he eventually, his public career uh, sort of collapsed when in a, he published a book, which by the way, Glenn Beck is on the road right now with this book, uh, telling every American they need to read this book. Um, the new version of the book is not complete. Uh, they cut out some lines that were deemed unacceptable and published at the time by Skelson, uh, in which he refers to black children as pickings. Uh, but also goes on at great length to explain how the victims of, quote, slavery were the, quote, white owners, because they had to provide for these people who could not provide for themselves. Um, and then African Americans were better off under slavery. Um, and this was a very important point to him to make, uh, because they wanted to advance this argument that the uh, Founding fathers were these great infallible figures and seemed to explain away America's early history of uh, racism. So he put together this version of the Constitution, it's still published to this day. Um, that's why these folks have it. And you get the Constitution in it in very small, lengthy print that um, very few people will read. But then it's in interspersed with little pictures of the Founding Fathers. And under each one is a quote. Um, and that's what people are going to read. And those quotes are all taken out of context. But if you look at them all, what those quotes tell you is that uh, America was created by God as a Christian nation and as a gift to white people. And America needs to be governed with this in mind. Um, and um, this constitution, therefore, when it was, you know, in pictures in the media, when the uh, Malheur was taken over, is well known in the right-wing militia, posse comitatus, Christian identity movement. So when those folks were looking at this picture in the newspaper, sitting in Miami or Cleveland, um, Albuquerque, they see that, that's the sign. Oh, we know who this guy is. We know what the blue system really is. And that's when they start streaming 
toward Kearney County um, to join this movement. Um, so deep is this thought that uh, Claude Bunny actually published an uh, op-ed recently, just before he was arrested, um, claiming that the Constitution was written by Jesus. <laughs> and again, you know, it's crazy. I, I, you know, you can lie, and, and I did, but you know, there's something really deep going on there, right? Because if Jesus inspired the New Testament, well, that was over in a different country. That was in a different holy land. So they need to somehow bring Jesus here on site to make this a kind of indigenous white Christian holy land. Um, and so they're almost required by logic. Um, to bring in Jesus as the writer of the Constitution, which then also means it's a Christian document. This is a country that should be run under Christian law by more Christians. Um, so we're going to move on. Look at a couple more of these um, pain we dealt with. This guy, James Fry, is interesting. I talked to him a few times up there. Um, David was one of the last people out. Um, it was one of the last four that held up. Uh, I actually thought he was going to kill himself, uh, but he did get out, thank God, before that happened. Um, besides wanting to write in all caps, uh, he has other problems, um, <laughs> as you can see. Um, and then this guy, John Ritzheimer. Um, there's a lot you can say about John Ritzheimer, but I'll just leave it at this. Um, well known for uh, uh, citing violent um, protests against Muslims in America, starting to kill them uh, on many occasions. Um, and he was up there too. So they span the whole spectrum um, of racist thought. Now, this is Gold Butte, an area in Nevada, and this was the site of the very first Bundy standoff in 2014. Um, Clive stopped paying his grazing fees, Fed kind of harassed him for 20 years to do it. Um, he didn't do it, and the Feds finally um, came in and tried to take his cattle away. Um, and that led to that armed standoff uh, and finally the shooting of uh, and killing of five people, which is something that is often forgotten about that, that first standoff. Um, what wasn't talked about so much in there um, was what Clive was doing on Gold Butte to Native American historical sites. So I want to zoom in on this picture here. That's a bullet hole right there. Um, and one of the complaints that the BLM had about them uh, is that he's desecrating uh, sites of the Moapa Paiute down there um, with his cattle eroding them, stepping on the sites. Um, and, excuse me? <laughs> um, and, and actually shooting them. And remember, you go back to uh, uh, Ryan Bundy earlier talking about, you know, before the white man came, cattle were just stepping all over these artifacts. Um, it's quite bizarre, uh, given his own family was involved uh, in desecrating these sites. So that was the 2014 site. Um, from there, they thought they had the, the um, formula for success to create armed standoffs. They began looking around the West for local controversies that they could go up to pour gas on the fire um, and try to create new standoffs uh, to get the revolution going. Um, this is, my slides a little backwards. So this is the next site. This is Recapture Canyon in southern Utah. Uh, southern Utah is full of uh, high density of uh, Native American uh, villages, cultural sites of all kinds. Recapture Canyon uh, is one of the most amazing of those. And BLM 
closed it to car travel a few years ago, 2006, because people were driving in and stealing the artifacts wholesale to sell in trucks and driving them out. So BLM closed it to, to uh, car travel, uh, allowed entry by foot or bicycle. Um, and the Bundys came to believe that this was a violation of their civil rights. And in a way, it was. Because in their worldview, in this white Christian nation, to close off access to anything in order to respect a non-white culture is a violation of their worldview. Um, and so they believe they had to go up there and right this wrong, stop this tremendous injustice. Um, and so they did. And they organized this uh, group of uh, ATV years going into the canyon, uh, driving over, destroying the Native American sites there. There's Ryan Muddy with his son, American flag, um, doing the same thing, leading them there. The background, all guy there, that's uh, um, John Ritzheimer. And from there, of course, you know, they went up to Burns. Um, and the Mount Hill Reservation, I went up there to protest um, every day, um, try to remind them in public uh, that this is public land, that this is Native American land as well. And uh, you know, one of the most interesting moments I had up there was uh, uh, on our last protest up at the uh, militia compound where earlier in the day, uh, we had a rally off-site um, and a contingent of representatives in the Burns Mayu tribe came out and joined us uh, off-site and afterwards we had a discussion about going up to the compound itself and bringing the rally there and, uh, and a group of the younger Burns Pirates came, came with us and we went up there uh, and this is uh, Got from Senator Tom McKinnon, um, and one of the uh, Burns Pirates. I don't know his name. But maybe, uh, Eric Holly. Eric Holly. Eric Holly from the tribe, and we uh, held a protest up there, which was uh, very, very powerful. And um, we were getting tired by that. We were going up every day, taking a tremendous amount of uh, abuse up there. Um, it was very, very intense. He was trying to kill us with one gun at us. And by this time, we were kind of getting worn out and uh, feeling a bit cranky and not exactly looking forward to going up to the compound. Um, and at that point, um, the chairwoman of the Burns Party, um, Charlotte Rugby, and Jarvis Kennedy, who I'll introduce soon, uh, came and did a smudging ceremony for us to remind us of what we were there for. Um, and it was a beautiful moment and a really empowering moment that I was especially moved you know, when she reminded us to pray for the occupiers. Because they had been let down around the path, they were confused. And but they were human, and we had to pray for them as well, and go up there uh, into this dangerous situation with that in our minds, because that was what we bring a peaceful resolution, a peaceful energy to that place, and it's just just what we needed at that time. Um, so I'm not going to talk a lot more about um, what the Bundys did uh, to the land, culture, and artifacts uh, of the Burns Pirates, but Jarvis Kennedy will. And I just know up here to speak now. Jarvis is councilman for the Burns Pirate Tribe. Uh, he's a traditional men's dancer and singer. Uh, he's a very brave man. 
um, to speak out there at that time against the militia culture, against a group that was so intensely violent and racist at the same time, uh, and speak up for the tribe, for the land, for their history. So with that, I'll ask Charles Kennedy to come up. <laughs> 